and Karen has designed many of the sites that we look at and read daily. Um, um, but it seems to me the kind of most appropriate thing which will become clear in our talk is that in the war between blob content and um, chunked content, she is a five-star general leading us. Uh, <laughs> the practitioners of chunked content. So with that, Karen, thank you so much for coming and speaking to us. We'll Thank you all so much. This is like, uh, I, I mean, I, it's like I can't wait to go back and tell everybody how like awesome this content strategy crowd is. So, honestly, like, uh, I feel like I'm among friends here. I can tell you guys this. Uh, this this is the talk that started. The, 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 this talk, the, the the fact that I ever wrote this talk about a year and a half ago is the reason that I wrote a book, and. And it has been so wonderful to me. I mean, it's like I have gotten so much out of being able to give this talk to so many people. And also, I have given it 900 times this year. And so this event apart that I just gave it at this morning was kind of like my, this is like my victory lap with this like particular talk. And so I am like giddy with excitement to be here. And also, I'm also pretty excited for 2013. So, um, Let's do this thing. So I do a lot of work with like traditional publishers, mainstream publishers. I led the redesign of the New York Times a few years back. Uh, I have dragged more magazines kicking and screaming onto the internet than I can count. It's like the Atlantic and Fast Company and the Week and Time Out. And I really like talking about the challenges that traditional publishers face. Because in a sense, it's kind of like they're, they're like the canary in the coal mine, you know? It's like they have to adapt to changes in technology so much more quickly. They feel the pain so much more acutely. And so these days, like the, the, the poison gas that is like causing birds to fall from the sky in the publishing houses is mobile. Or more precisely, how is it that they are going to spray their content out onto all of these new different devices and platforms and screen sizes and resolutions. And it's, it's, it's tempting. It's like, I know what you're thinking. You're like, looking at this crowd here, you're like, but Karen, isn't mobile like a design and development problem? Like, isn't, I mean, isn't mobile all about like, how do we adjust our aesthetic for you know different screen sizes or you know different different you know different design aesthetic, um, how do we isn't isn't a design problem of how we take advantage of these new like gestural interactions afforded by touch screens, or you know isn't isn't the problem of mobile all like a development problem? Isn't it all like responsive web versus native apps versus iOS versus Android versus like what do we develop for and how are we going to maintain it? And I'm like, look guys. Design and development, those are all like super important problems, don't, don't get me wrong, but you know what's really important is content. It's content. Like how are we going to figure out how we are going to create and manage and maintain and govern our content across all of these different new platforms? So let me give you a little example here. Two very different companies, both publishers how they have decided to handle this particular problem. So NPR is obviously America's national public radio. Condé Nast is the blue chip magazine publisher. They publish titles like Vogue and Vanity Fair and The New Yorker. So Condé. Condé has been investing really heavily in building custom iPad editions of many of their titles like GQ or Glamour, Vanity Fair, wired even, and make no mistake about it, this is the print magazine. This is the print edition. This is the layout and the design and the styling and the, the aesthetic, the art direction, all repurposed from the print edition and, you know, ported over to their new digital versions. So when the iPad first came out, uh, 
I had a conversation with the great Paul Ford. Um, here it's a blog called F Train. If you're not if you are not reading F Train, I would strongly encourage you to start doing so right now. Uh, he only updates it like once a year, so it's super easy to keep up with. Um, so Paul wrote the foreword to my book, which uh, I'm incredibly grateful for. Uh, and so Paul used to work for Harper's, and you know he and I we like to talk about the publishing industry. And so, I, you know, when the iPad first came out, I happened to be at a party with Paul, and, you know, we were kind of like, oh my god, the iPad, and look at this, this is this amazing new form factor, and this device, and this screen size, and this, all of these new opportunities afforded by these, like, touchscreen behaviors and gestural interactions, and so many opportunities for storytelling, and what do you think the magazine industry is going to do with this? And he was like, I think we're about to usher in a golden age of PDFs on the iPad. <laughs> uh, and this is in fact true, right? I mean, it's like if you have ever uh, tried to use one of these like so-called digital editions, uh, it's like it's like a giant picture of the print magazine. It's like you could drive to a convenience store in the next county and buy the print edition before you could download one of these things. It's like you get it. And it's like, you realize, like, oh my god, this is just a giant rasterized picture of the print magazine. You can't, like, search the text or copy and paste the text into, like, your blog. You can't, you can't even, like, share an article with a friend because there's no way to, like, give them a pointer to, like, the actual article location. Um, and Condé, bless their hearts. Uh, Kindness would be better off if this was, in fact, what they were doing, was taking big pictures of the print magazine and sending them to your iPad. But no, 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 Condé, Condé has decided to take this a lot further. They are having their existing production staffers stay up nights and weekends after the print magazine has gone to bed so they can make not one, but two unique layouts for the iPad. And this is apparently because... Uh, Somebody at Condé got the message that the iPad edition had to be, like, interactive. Uh, and so even though you can't, like, search the text or share the text, I mean, at least you can have the, the experience of being able to, like, rotate the iPad and watching the layout update. Um, and, you know, it's like I work with these companies. I, I, and it's like I can just imagine the meetings that they're having where it's like, you know, I can just imagine the print side of the house being like, finally, we can take a big picture of the print magazine and like send that to the iPad. All of our digital problems are solved. Um, you know, and, and it's like, I can just hear them. And it's like, they are, they are hearkening. It's, it's like, you just imagine these meetings. And it's like, the editorial staff is, is like imagining that they're, 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 they're hearkening back to these halcyon days where it's like their advertising rates were at an all-time high, where the editors had a limousine that came and like take, pick them up to take them to work every day, where, where every afternoon the guy with the cart filled with cocaine rolled his way through the aisles. It's like they are hearkening back to the 1980s when publishing made sense to them. Because they were in control. Because everything that, that you experienced when, when you consumed, when you read, when you engaged with any of their products was as fixed and defined as ink on paper. They were in control of every aspect of everything that you experienced. The layout, the design, the styling, the flow, the interaction, everything made sense to them. The 80s are gone, guys. Like, they're not coming back. So NPR has taken a very different approach to this, this particular problem. Now, this is a, this is a profoundly unsexy slide. Uh, this doesn't look anywhere near anything as slick and glossy or produced as anything you're going to see from Condé. But with this, this, this approach, this is NPR's how, this is how NPR handles this, this exact same problem. And that's an approach that they call COPE. And it stands for Create Once, Publish Everywhere. And what this means, what this approach means, is that they can take 
content that comes from a variety of different sources. They can take content that comes from their content providers. Oops. They can take content that comes from their music partners. And what they do is they run it through this API. And what that, that's what that means, that's just kind of a fancy way of saying that they can treat their content like it's a service. And so that allows all of these different devices and platforms to be able to go in and talk to that content and you know, essentially to like query it like it's a service and say, hey, what content can you give me? And then what that means is that each of those different devices and platforms can make its own decision about what content it wants to show and how it wants that content to appear. So as an example, what that means is that you can see the exact same story that appears here on NPR.org. The story has a headline, it has an audio file, it's got multiple images, it's got the body text of the story, um, it's got, you can't see it here, but it's got not one but two different summaries of the story. And so you can see, here's what they choose to show on NPR.org. Here's what they choose to show on the NPR.org player. Here's how the exact same story appears on their iPhone app. Here's how it appears on their mobile website. Here's how the same story appears on the NPR Addict iPhone app. Now, they didn't even make this app. This is user-generated app. It's pulling in their content through their API. Here's how the same story appears on the public radio player. This is pulling in content from 500 public radio stations nationwide. Same story, WBUR in Boston. Here's how it looks on NPR in Minneapolis. Here's how the same story looks on iGoogle. You could set this up yourself at home using RSS. Here's how the exact same story looks on the desktop application of iTunes. Now, at this point, they're just showing off. If you wanted to hook your TV set up to your Xbox and you know, pull up NPR on your television set, you could look at the exact same story there. And all of this, all of these different platforms and devices are made possible by the fact that NPR has a content management system that gathers structured content, clean, presentation-independent content, just the right metadata, just the right fields, presumably easy enough for their journalists to use, and that they have an API that allows all of these different devices and platforms and say, hey, hey, you know what, hey, content, you know what I'd like to have? I'd like to have a title, and I'd like to have three images, and I'd like to have the full body text of the story. And the content's like, okay, you can have that. And then another platform can come in and be like, hey, don't give me any of that body text, I don't need that. You know what I want is I want the title and I want the audio file. No images, no nothing. And the content's like, sure, I can give you that too. All of that is made possible by the fact that they treat their content like it's a service that is intended to dynamically allow individual devices and platforms to choose what they want to share. And you know, I, I will confess to you guys, sometimes I give this talk and people are like, Karen, you don't care, you don't, you don't understand design, you don't care about the brand, all you care about is your structured content and metadata and all that nerdy stuff and you don't, you don't understand how important the brand is. And I'm like, I care very deeply about design, okay? I, I really give, I care a lot about that. You know what, I care so much about that that I believe that each individual device or platform needs to have the power to make its own decisions about how the content should look and how somebody should get to interact with it. I do not believe that design decisions should be made by a platform further upstream like print, and that those design decisions should be inherited by platforms further down in the system. In fact, I believe that, ever, that if you care about design, if you care about experience, if you care about providing the right interaction for, individual, for users, then you should care about having a base of structured content to work from so that you can make the right decisions for that particular platform. So that those decisions are not inherited from some platform further down the stream. So it's like, if you care about design, then you should care about something that looks profoundly undesigned. Because that's how we're gonna get to a place of being able to deliver the right experience for people. So, I, I mean, I just, I gotta, I gotta like, I'd be really clear about this, I really care about design. You know what else I care about? 
is is money. I like I like money. Um, um, so, which which one of these strategies do you think is paying off most handsomely for the organization in question? So, the last numbers that Condé has released for uh, its iPad editions are from the end of 2010. So they're a little bit old, but these are these are the last actual official numbers that they've come out with. And I'm sad to say the numbers don't look so great. Um, and you know, I would like to call your attention to to poor Glamour magazine here. So Glamour, Glamour is known within the publishing industry as being Condé Nast's most lucrative title. They sell two million annual subscriptions. They sell another 500,000 copies every month on the newsstand. Each month, 1.5 million unique visitors go to Glamour.com. Can you imagine being the poor, beleaguered, Glamour Magazine staffer who has to sit up nights and weekends after the print publication goes to bed, making not one, but two unique layouts for the iPad edition so that they can sell fewer than 3,000 copies. I mean, that's just not a good use of anybody's time, right? That's just not a good use of resources. So in contrast to that, NBR has seen their page views go through the roof. I mean, look at this chart. It is just about to like explode off of the page here. Like, look at this. NPR has seen their page view growth go up 80%, exact same time period, exact same time period in 2010. NPR saw their page view grow up 80%. Can you imagine if Condé Nast had seen 80% growth as a result of their iPad strategy? The guy with the cocaine cart would be back. <laughs> and they directly attribute that 80% growth to their API. Or more precisely, the biggest impact that that API had was with their mobile strategy. So as a result of developing this API, they were able to build specialized applications that allow them to get their content out onto this wide range of different devices and platforms without having to do custom development to access the content, okay? What that means is they don't have to go into that content and strip out all of the design and the formatting that was intended for some other platform and then get it onto another device. So what this has meant is that they were able to build their iPhone app and their iPad app and their mobile website and their Android app and their HTML5 side, some of them in a matter of weeks, like really quick turnaround. And more important, the time that they were spending on building and designing those apps all went to them figuring out what was the right experience, what was the right interaction model for that particular platform. Because they already had a base of structured content that they knew how to work with. So I think NBR is just, should be justifiably proud of this strategy, which is you know, which I'm, it's something that I'm kind of loosely calling adaptive content. And so when I talk about, you know, what is this, this idea of having adaptive content? First thing I want to make clear to everybody is that this future of adaptive content, where we're going to be able to get our content out onto all these different devices and platforms, this is not new. Frankly, a lot of really smart people have been wrestling with this problem for a good long time. And we stand on their shoulders and we should be grateful for it. So Anne Rockley um, has been calling it intelligent content for more than a decade. Her latest book, Managing Enterprise Content, is just out and you all should read it. Um, other people have called it you know, flexible content or adapt, you know, semantic content, atomized content. What it means is that you start with a base of content. Clean, structured, presentation independent content that is written or designed or created from the start with the intent that it can live in any one of these different platforms or devices that it might need to live on. Because guess what? It's going to have to. So as an example of how this might work, let me take you back once again to those glorious days in the 1980s where America had a favorite magazine. And so what do you think this favorite magazine was? Was it like, I don't know, the New York Review of Books, perhaps? No, no, America's favorite magazine was, yes, the TV Guide. Never let it be said that Americans don't read. Uh, and so, TV Guide, way back, this is like way back in the 1980s, TV Guide put together a green screen 
mainframe application and told all of their writers that in the future, they were not going to write just one program description. Instead, they were going to write three. They were going to write a short form, they were going to write a medium form, and they were going to write a long form. And any of you who have ever you know, been a writer, worked with writers, predictably, the writers were like, what? Why? Why? Why am I doing this? Why? You just tripled my workload. What? What? Why? Why, am I, why am I doing this? This is crazy. Why? Thing is, they didn't know. They had no idea. They had no idea where this content was going to go live in the future. They didn't know that one day your cable company was going to give you a box that would hook up to your television set and allow you to dynamically see what programs were on right from that box. They didn't know that one day TiVo was going to come along and allow, you know, revolutionize your experience of watching television by allowing you to like have a giant easy to use VCR that was hooked up to your TV and let you choose whatever programs you wanted to see in advance. They didn't know that one day you were going to have this magical pocket robot that was going to come out and you could like have it talk to your television set. You could pull this little machine out of your pocket and tell it to be like, hey, Go record the wire for me. And it would be like, okay. They had no idea where all of this content could possibly go live in the future. But what they did know was that if all of their content was locked up in Quark files, if all of their content was created with, solely with the intent that it was going to live in a print magazine, that it would have no value. And so, this in fact turned out to be true. So, TV Guide, what they did is they, they wound up splitting the company in two, took the assets of the magazine company, they took the, the company that had like the, the database of the content. The assets of the magazine brand were sold for one dollar. One dollar. Less than the cost of a single issue on the newsstand to buy the assets of an entire magazine publishing brand. You know why? Because there's no value in it. All of the value was in that structured content. And so what, what is it that they did to, to ensure the value of their content beyond whatever platform they were publishing it on? So I think they did three things. First, they created multiple sizes. So they said, hey, our content, it's going to have to be flexible in the future, and so we're going to have to think of it as a dynamic system of sizes so that you know, it, it has the potential to be able to live in different places. Second, they had meaningful metadata attached to it. So you know, it would have been very easy for them to say, sure, you know, we show the title of the television program and the genre of the television program. Yeah, all that information is bolded in our print edition. What good does that do you? Like, unless that is stored in a system, in a dynamic system that allows you to do something with that as metadata, it's not meaningful. Yeah, fine, you bolded it in your Quark files, but that's no good. And then finally, that content has been written with the intent that it's going to be reused. It is written by an organization where they went to their content creators and they said, hey, don't just imagine that this is going to live in this one and only one place that you're thinking of it. You have to imagine that this content is going to possibly live in other places in the future. And so when I look at this space right now, when I look at like who, who's doing interesting stuff, like who is really innovating around how they handle multi-channel content, it's like, why is it, why is it the Boston Globe is the first you know, organization that comes out with a, you know, a major relaunch of a really innovative, responsively designed website that kind of blows everybody's mind and goes, makes everybody go, oh man, this is totally possible. Why is it the Guardian? is able to say, hey, we are going to revamp, we are going to, we're going to start from scratch our entire editorial workflow. We're going, to, we're going to rethink the entire way that we create content to move to a digital first mindset. Why is it NPR? NPR started five years ago on developing this API. Five years ago, before most, before most of these devices or platforms that we're talking about even existed, NPR started building an API to allow different devices to be able to talk to their content. Why is it 
that when you look at this space, that news organizations are the innovators here. Like, why, is it, why, why are all these companies news organizations? Well, I will tell you. It's because news organizations already have structured content. So everybody who's been to journalism school is taught, like you have to write the head, you gotta write a headline. It's like a short summary of what the story's about. You heard the expression, don't bury the lead. It means put the most important ideas of the story up front, just because no one's gonna read further if you don't. They have not one, but two different structures for, for uh, photo captions. They have captions, which is like the headline of the photo, and they have cut lines, which is like the deck of the photo. They have my particular favorite content structure, which is the nut graph. It stands for nutshell paragraph. It, it's like a bulleted list that uh, calls out the most important items in the story. And so, as somebody who works in, in the web and mobile and, and multi-channel content, it's like, it's very easy for me to look at this and say, hey, if I had all of these different content structures to work with, if I had all of these different things called out as unique content chunks, think what I would be able to do with this. Think of all the opportunities that I would have to be able to do interesting and unique things with this content or to be able to serve content to different devices or interactions because I had the structure built in. So journalists, news organizations, people are taught to create content this way. But most organizations, probably many organizations that you work with, certainly the magazine industry, they're not taught to create this content this way. Instead, they're taught to imagine that their content is gonna live in one and only one place and that they are in control of every single thing there is to control about that content. So I had this great conversation with, uh, with Sarah Chubb, who's the former president of Condé Nast Digital. And, you know, I was talking to her about the challenges that these magazine brands face, like Vanity Fair, in figuring out how they're going to adapt to the digital world. And, you know, she, it's like she said, it's like it's really scary for these magazine brands to think about their package, their experience, their beautifully constructed way that they want you to consume their content. It's really scary for them to imagine that that's all gonna get like chopped up and devolved into all of these different discrete little chunked content elements. And you know, the truth is, it's like, I understand that. It is, it probably is scary. I mean, it's like, I, I genuinely believe that that's the future of digital content. But for them to get there, it's gonna take a lot of imagination and insight and understanding and frankly, a lot of courage. Because the challenge that we're facing, I mean, the issues that we're getting at here are really getting to some of the most fundamental roots of what we think about what it means to communicate, what it means to present information. We're getting down to like the very roots of this notion that we have of the tight connection between content and form. The tight connection that we, play, that we make between what something means and what something looks like. The idea that you can't communicate meaning of the content, priority or weight, or you know, the value of content, separate from the styling of the content, and you know, the, the, the hierarchy, the, the, the visual layout and styling of that information. And you know, that's something that it's like, it, it starts way, way up at the very, very top of the experience, like you know, the, the very tip of the art direction, and the, the, our beliefs around what it means to communicate information through layout or styling presentation. And it's something that goes all the way down, way deep into the bowels of our content management infrastructure, where we have content management systems that are coupled, which means that these coupled systems force us to think that content authoring and storage are the exact same task as content display and content publishing. That we, that we have content management systems that essentially force us to think that there's no difference between creating content and displaying that content. And so that, I mean, this, this issue, this gets, this gets down to, to, I think, what is probably the fundamental issue that all of us are wrestling with on the web. And it's this. That way down inside, way, way deep down inside, maybe where people aren't even willing to admit it to themselves, People believe that there is a real way 
that you are supposed to consume the content. A real place where that content is supposed to live. There's a right way for you to read that content. There's a primary platform where that content is supposed to be consumed. And yeah, maybe, okay, fine, we'll let you read it someplace else if you really insist on it, but you're not supposed to read it there. <laughs> you're supposed to read it in print. And it's like, don't believe me? New York Times. They just came out with a new section recently called the Sunday Review, replaced the old Week in Review section. How do you think they came up with this? Well, they got their writers and their editors and their art directors and their designers and their publishers and they all sat around in a room and they brainstormed and they mocked up and they concepted and they came up with ideas and they sketched things out and they got everything sort of like mocked up and laid out and they approved it and they ran it up the flagpole and they got everybody happy about it and they turned around and they said to the digital team, here, put this on the internet. <laughs> so the digital team was like, uh, I... I, don't, I mean, I don't know what we can do with that giant image that you had on the section front, but uh, we could, I guess we could uh, put that big comic strip that you were so funny, we could put the big comic strip there, and then, uh, I don't know, the rest of the stories, uh, I guess we could like put them in boxes. We, we, we like boxes uh, on the web. Um, and then the mobile team was like, hey, you know what I think would be awesome is we just took a big uh, list of all the stories, and then we just put them in a big list on the page. And they're like, yeah, that comic strip that you're so fond of, I'm going to put that at the end here. Uh, and so I would like to marvel for just a moment here. Uh, Really, I love this screen. I, I, I would like to mar have you all marvel for just a second at the sheer amount of navigation chrome that exists on this page solely designed to get you to click on this one tiny link and oh, it's broken. <sighs> it's really satisfying to get judgy about this. I mean, it's like I just look at this and I'm like, stupid print dinosaurs and your stupid myopic focus and your stupid dying platform. <laughs> stupid. Because <laughs> it's like, we would never do anything that's stupid, right? Right? <laughs> Well, no, of course we are, okay? I mean, it's like, of course, we're doing the exact same thing. I mean, it's like at least print has like a hundred years of like tradition and values and history and culture to rely on. It's like, what do we have? We've got like 10 years of using really bad content management systems. And it's like, I guarantee you, I guarantee that you have people in your organization that think that their job is making web pages. That they think that they are in the web page publishing business. That they are sitting there and they are creating their content and they're hitting the preview button and they're imagining how great their content's gonna look when they publish it on the desktop web. They are doing the exact same thing. Where they believe that there is a real place that their content's gonna live, it's just that they think it's the desktop web. And so when I talk about adaptive content, what I mean is that we are not starting with print. We're not starting with a base of print content and then figuring out how we can like translate all of the design decisions that we made for print and figure out how to get them to work on digital. And, but I also don't mean that we're starting with web. Like I don't mean that we are starting with a web page, you know, web content or frankly even you know, web page, God forbid, and like figuring out how we're just like smush that down so it'll like show up on a smaller screen. And you know, with all due respect to Luke Rabluski and the mobile first world, it's like, I don't, we're not starting with mobile either. Like, I don't mean that you start with, like, the smallest base of content that you want to work with and then figure out how to, like, progressively enhance that content for other platforms. No. What I mean is that we're starting with a base of content, okay? A clean base of presentation-independent, structured content with meaningful metadata attached that is intended from the start that it can go and live on any one of these platforms or devices that it might need to. That this, this content is intended from the start that it can go anywhere. Because you know what? It's going to have to go everywhere. So, how are we going to do this? How are we going to make this happen? What has to change? So, I said earlier, 
TV Guide example that I gave, they did three things right. They created multiple sizes, they attached meaningful metadata, and they wrote their content for reuse. So what this implies to me is there's some things that have to change in the way our organizations work and the way that people create content. So the first thing is that we've got to get content creators in the mindset that they have to write for the chunk and not for the page. That they are not in the web page creation business or the, the brochure page creation business, but rather that they're in the content creation business and they have to create structured chunks of content. What that means, if we're going to get there, what that means is that we've got to teach people why creating metadata is so important or why having meaningful metadata attached to their content is actually a really good thing. And then finally, if we're actually going to get to, you know, it's like we're going to get people to write structured chunks of content, if we're going to get people to create meaningful metadata, the only way we're going to get there is if there is actually a better content management infrastructure and workflow that supports them in completing their tasks. So let's start with the first, first one here, writing for the chunk and not the page. So this, this is Amazon.com. Perhaps you've heard of it. Uh, Amazon. So Amazon... I would like to say, I think they've done an admirable job of taking what is in fact a very dense page of information and figuring out how to make that, how to translate that so it's meaningful on a smaller screen. So if you were to search for digital camera, you go to a page, there's a lot of information on this page. And they've done a really nice job of making it, you know, turning that into a mobile screen where you can tap into individual products and see more. So if you tapped on one of these products, when you go to the desktop page for an individual camera, it's like, Holy cats, there is a lot of information on this screen. It's like there's all the product information and there's other products you could buy and there's technical details and product details and the whole product description and you know what the manufacturer wants you to know and more products you can buy and all the customer reviews. It's like, wow. Is it for me? You know, there's a lot of things that you have to read and scroll through on the screen. And so even at this level, I think they have, again, done a nice job because they have structured content. So what they can do is they can take each one of these chunks and they can turn that into a tap target so that you can go on and tap on a, a particular piece of information and go see it. But here's the thing, when you tap on one of those, those pieces of content, like for example, the product information, what you find is that this content was not necessarily written with the intent that it was gonna be reused. So let's look here. Under the, the product details, here's this product features section. I don't really think that's how a bulleted list is supposed to work. I don't really think uh, that you should just cram a bulleted list into whatever space you have available and just have the bullets show up in running text anywhere you want them to. That's just kind of categorically, I think that's the exact opposite of the way you're supposed to use a bulleted list. Call me crazy. You go to the next screen. Product description. Ah, yes, this vexing punctuation problem we've been trying to solve on the web for like the last 10 or, 10 or 15 years. We're going to get it right one of these days, I promise. Let's see what the manufacturer wants to tell us about this camera. Capture life's best moments. Don't miss the moment. Birthdays, weddings, babies, first steps. It's like Nikon. I want you to sell me a camera, not on the concept of photography. Can you imagine if you went into Best Buy and you were like, which camera should I buy? And the salesman was like, capture life's best moments. <laughs> so, so I had I a point here, and it's important, and I'm to beat you over the head with it. This. This is Amazon.com's product page. This is one of the most intensely analyzed and designed and researched and tested pages on the internet. They have A-B tested the shit out of this thing. And when they got to mobile, they basically told the robots to go into the database, shovel out whatever content they found there, and when they ran out of room, to quit typing. It's like, we cannot assume that the content that we have created for the desktop website is going to work when you shovel it into a 44 or 88 pixel tap target. That that's going to work for whatever navigation summaries we need it for. That that's going to work when it's presented in a completely different context. We can't just assume that whatever content we've created without intending that it's going to be reused is going to be appropriate for reuse. And so the, the root of this problem, the, the real root of this, is that when you get into the content management interfaces, 
that people want to use, what, what content creators beg for, what they, what they demand, is they insist that they have to have a giant blob that works just like Microsoft Word. They want to imagine that what they are creating for the desktop web is just, it works exactly like Microsoft, if they were creating a brochure that they were going to print out on their laser printer next to their desk. What they want is they want a WYSIWYG toolbar and they want all of the formatting options that are available. When, you know, when they're working in Microsoft Word, they want to be able to embed tables and images and they want to add whatever formatting they want and they want to be able to float the text to the right and they want to make it purple comic sans if they want. It's like they want to be able to treat the web as if it is as fixed and controlled and stable as putting ink on paper just like Microsoft Word prints out to their laser printer. And so what we are fighting against, what we are fighting against is these, these, these giant blobs of stuff, these giant blobs of formatting where our content creators are going in there and saying, okay, yeah, I'm gonna dump whatever I want in there. And so what you get is these blobs that have all of this formatting and information and styling embedded in them. And then what happens when you wanna take that content? and put it anywhere else. What happens when it's time for you to get that content and put it on some other platform? Well, you gotta go in and strip all that formatting out, right? But that's the thing. Somebody spent a lot of time on that formatting. And so that formatting is meaning. And so it's, it's like we're imagining that we have content creators saying, no, 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 really what I need is I need this giant blob of stuff in which I can dump everything that I want. These, messy, formatting, rich, presentation-dependent, platform-dependent blobs of stuff versus clean, well-structured, present-independent chunks in which, that are semantically meaningful. It's like, this is a war, you guys. This is a war between blobs versus chunks. You all, my friends, you are on Team Chunk. We cannot let the blobs win. And so what this means is that we've all got to fight for the opportunity. We've got, to, we've got to fight for the idea that, yes, you do have to enter your content into meaningful fields. You do have to add appropriate metadata to your content. That the, all of the information that you want to encode about your content cannot solely be conveyed through the fact that you really want to make it Purple Comic Sans right now. Instead, you have to encode that meaning in your content by how it is structured and what metadata you attach to it. And so it's like, if we're gonna get there, it's like we really have to communicate to people the idea that, that instead of just using styling to communicate meaning, they have to mark up their, they have to add some information to their content that is actually meaningful metadata. We have to demystify the concept of metadata for people. And it's because metadata, it's like we don't have enough designers and editors and art directors to sit there and lovingly handcraft the experience for every single platform that we want to get our content onto. When we only had one platform and it was print, sure, sure, you could have an art director that sat there and you know figured out how to handcraft every single page. Guess what? There's 11 billion platforms now and they just keep coming. And there's no way we're ever going to be able to survive this zombie apocalypse of platform unless we start treating metadata like it's the new art direction. We can't rely on having a human being go in and make all of those design decisions. What we're going to have to do is allow the robots to make some decisions for us. We're going to have to say, how can we use metadata and business rules to help guide our design decisions, to help allow each platform to make its own choices about how things should, should be laid out and styled and how they should look. And so, just so an example of this, it's like, we can't afford to have all of our prioritization decisions be intended for a single platform and then expect other platforms to figure out how to inherit those choices. We, can't, we cannot make decisions about priority for content that are conveyed only through styling information intended for one platform and then lose them for future platforms. So let me give you an example of this, The Guardian. Guardian has these things called topic pages. They're like automatically generated pages based on proper nouns. So it'll go into the database and it'll pull out all the stories that it has about Tony Blair, automatically show them on this like dynamically generated page, great for SEO. So 
when they first came up with these pages, they had this box here called Top Story. Great idea, fantastic idea, except once they launched it, they realized, oh, snap. We have no way of knowing what a top story is. Like, we don't have any way in, in the content that exists in our current system to know whether one story is more important than another. We don't have any editorial priority metadata that is attached to these individual stories. Well, wow, what do we do? How are we going to solve this problem? Well, in the initial launch, what they said is like, oh, okay, more work for our editors. We'll just tell all the editors that as they enter and content into the system, they're going to have to encode each story one to five, give it a little editorial priority judgment. So that way we'll know whether a story is, is important or less important, and then we'll only show important stories in the top story box. Great, great. But wait, they do have a lot of editorial priority metadata. In fact, they have a whole team of people whose entire job is to sit around all day and figure out what their editorial priority metadata is by laying out the print edition. So, I'll show you that again, it's a nice animation. Um, it's like, you can tell all kinds of things about, an, you know, about, the, about these stories. You can tell all kinds of things just by looking at the layout of this page. You don't have to be able to read this, you know like how important a story is by how many column inches are devoted to it, how big the headline is, the placement of the story on the page, even things like what color the typography is or what the juxtaposition of the story is with the images tell you all kinds of things about the priority of that story. But they're all conveyed through visual styling. They're all conveyed solely through visual design decisions that are intended for one platform. And when they take this content and they put it on another platform, all of that decision making is lost. They don't have it in the digital edition. They didn't have it for those topic pages. So what they figured out for their iPad edition was that, hey, we are actually putting a lot of work into figuring out this editorial priority metadata. What if we could find some way, when we go to the iPad edition, to be able to pull that out? So what they did is they wrote an algorithm that goes into their InDesign files, reads the layout of the print edition, and then uses that layout to derive some editorial priority judgment that they then use to dynamically lay out the iPad edition. The iPad edition has its own styling, its own interaction model. It's not inheriting design decisions from print the way that Condé is doing. But what it is doing is saying, how can we leverage the value that our editors are putting in to making all of these design decisions and use that so that we don't lose it when we move to another platform. So I don't really think that robots that read print InDesign files is the answer for most organizations, probably not. Uh, but it, it sort of like leads you to the mindset of like, oh, right. When I'm trying to take content from platform to platform, how can I make sure that the decisions that I'm making about styling or the decisions that I'm making about the meaning of the content don't get lost in the format. And so the real answer to that, I mean, this, this problem, what this basically gets down to, is the challenge of how do we make sure that we have a content management process and infrastructure and workflow that actually supports our content creators in, in, in creating content that has the right meaning and the right values attached to it, that doesn't get them caught up in making platform-dependent styling decisions. And so with that, you know, with that, it's like, I get to see a lot of companies' content management underpants. Uh, you know, I do a lot of work like this. And, um, and it's like, it's embarrassing. It's like, I'm embarrassed for our field. It's like, most of these systems look like a database got drunk and vomited all over the screen. It's like, fields everywhere, and it's like, you go in and you try to understand how to use it, and you've got to have somebody like sitting next to you being like, yeah, 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 okay, you've got to enter something in this field here, and then you've got to like, scroll way down, and then you've got to enter something down here, and then you've got to take this code, copy and paste this code, and then scroll back up, because you've got to hit save, and if you hit save, you don't hit save, all your work is lost, so you've got to make sure you do that, and then you've got to go over to some other totally unintuitively labeled field, and you got to paste this code in. It's just like, it's like, no wonder everybody is begging for like a Microsoft Word like interface. No wonder everybody's like, give me a WYSIWYG toolbar and a giant blob in which I can dump anything I want. Of course they hate the CMS. 
Of course they hate all the fields. The workflow is terrible. The experience is terrible. It's like, and I look at this. I mean, I look, like, I look at this as a user experience person, and I'm like, this is a solvable problem. I mean, I feel like we solve problems like this all the time. I mean, there's just all kinds of examples of places in the, in, in the world where we have looked at a complex process and said, hey, let's try to make this experience better for people. I mean, it's like, I guarantee you, if you ran an e-commerce website, if you had an e-commerce website that expected a, you know, a human being to go in and fill out a bunch of form fields and like figure out what information they were gonna enter, you would go in and you would know every single place where people were running into problems, where people were dropping off, where people were making errors. You would know every single place where there was red on your transaction file because that would mean friction in the system. And you would go in and you would optimize that. You would go in and you would figure out how can I like smooth a little bit of this friction out of here? How can I make this experience a little bit easier for the person who's filling out this form? Because you would know that every place where you could, you know, squeeze a little bit of friction out of that system would be a, would be business value, would be an opportunity for you to make more money. Because you'd be like, great, I like made this experience better for somebody, and woohoo, I made more money out of it. So, if you're in the business of making content, then your content management workflow is every bit as important to business value as this e-commerce transaction funnel. And you know what, I don't know anybody, I don't know anybody who has any analytics data at all about the performance of their CMS. I don't know anybody who is doing usability tests with their content authors to figure out how they can optimize this system better. And it's like, we can't, we can't keep working this way. Like we can't keep treating decisions about what the right CMS is based on totally technical architecture concerns. You know, we can't just keep thinking that the right CMS is based on things like system requirements or security requirements or support requirements. All important things, don't get me wrong. You know what else is important? Whether somebody can actually use it. And, you know, we can't th keep thinking that, quote unquote, usability in the CMS is totally dependent on having, you know, a nice font and an attractive color palette and uh, you know some cute widgets that like expand and collapse. Yeah, it's like I like expandy collapsy widgets as much as the next person. But you know what? That doesn't make usability. You know what makes usability is the workflow. Real usability comes from the workflow. It comes from having a series of screens. It comes from having a process that somebody can follow that makes sense to them. Yeah, my friend Jeff Eaton is fond of saying that most content management systems treat the CM, you know, treat the interface like it's a window onto a database as opposed to an experience that helps content creators complete their tasks. And so, and it's like, I, you know, as I'm a UX person, you know, through and through, and it's like there's a million things that we know how to do that would make content management systems easier for people to use. It's like, why don't we do contextual inquiry, which is just like a fancy way of saying, hey, why don't we treat content creators like they're users? and go and sit and talk to them and watch them work and figure out what their mental model of the system is and then design a system that meets their needs. Heck, why don't we do card sorting? I mean, why don't we just go in and figure out how to make the labeling on all of these fields sort of consistent from screen to screen? I mean, it's like, that's not like a three-year, $11 billion CMS re replatforming challenge. That's like a smart information architect could go in and do that in like a few weeks. It doesn't cost that much. It's like, why don't we treat content management like it's an iterative prototyping process instead of insisting that every content management project that we do needs to be a three-year, $11 billion ordeal at the end of which no one ever wants to talk about the CMS again. It's <laughs> so, so like, instead, smart organizations recognize that the CMS is, is, is their business. Huffington Post, great digital first business, they are committing 10 to 12 changes to their CMS every single day, around the clock. And that's because they recognize that every change that they make to that content management system gives them business value. Frankly, way more business value than yet another homepage redesign would give them. And you know, and it's, it's like I say all this stuff, it's like I'm a UX person through and through, you know, I want, 
I want everybody who creates content in your organization to be happier. And, you know, and it's because I believe that you know, having happier, you know, it's like if you want to deliver on the experience that you want to deliver for your end users, there's no way you're going to get there unless you can deliver a great experience for your, your content creators. But it's like more than that. It's like I genuinely believe that we aren't going to be able to create the kind of content that we need to create. Structured content, presentation independent, metadata informed content, unless we have the tools that will help support us get there. And so it's like I can't, I can't allow organizations to think that having a content management system that is easy for people to use is this unimaginable luxury that they can't possibly get to until after they do yet another redesign of the public facing site. It's like we have to move into a mindset where having a great experience for content creators isn't seen as a luxury. It's seen as a necessity. It's seen as a requirement. And, you know, and my reason for that isn't just, you know, I, it's like I want happy users, I really do. But you know what else? It's because I really believe that that is where business value is gonna come from. That, that the ability to have this kind of structured content, that, is a, that we're able to get this content out across platform, that is the only way that we are gonna survive multi-channel publishing. And so, you know, when I look at what's happening in mobile these days, you know, it's daunting. I mean, it's like, I wrote a book on this stuff, and you know, when I go and talk to clients about it, I'm like, oh man, I feel bad that I have put myself out there as one of the people who knows the most of it about this right now, because this is scary. It's hard, and it's gonna be hard for years. You know what? That is awesome. It is fantastic. Because mobile is what I genuinely believe. It's gonna be the catalyst that is gonna make so many organizations wake up and say, oh, wait a minute. Our stuff, it can't just live on one platform. This isn't just a question of how do we take our print content and get it onto the web. Now it's like, oh my goodness, we've got print and web and mobile and native apps and in-car systems and refrigerators, and it's like the platforms, they're not gonna stop. And so it's what's gonna force organizations to go, let's take a step back from this, and let's figure out what can we do to use mobile as this wedge, to use the mobile as this driving force that will allow us to start thinking of our content in new ways. It's a huge, huge opportunity. And it's a huge opportunity for, to, for us to convince people, like, hey, it's like if you care about structured content, it's like if you care about having, you know, clean, chunked, presentation independent content, then, you know, the more structure, that it's like if you want structured content because you want your content to be free, Mobile is going to be the wedge that helps make that happen. The more structure that we put into our content, the freer, paradoxically, the freer it's going to become to be able to get out onto whatever platform or system or device we needed to get out onto. And so what that gets to is like, you know, what we really have to do is, you know, it's like it's time to like drive a stake right through the heart of all of our beliefs about the idea that meaning and, and, and value and priority of content can only be conveyed through visual styling. We've got to be able to find new tools that allow us to separate content from form, to separate you know, content from dis meaning from display, and instead add meaningful metadata and you know, add structured information to our content for real this time. You know, it's like we've been banging on this problem for a good long time, but you know, mobile and multi-channel publishing is what I think is really going to drive it home for people. And so what that means is that the future of our content management tools is going to be in their ability to capture their content in a clean and presentation independent way. The future of the tools that we are all going to be working with is going to be in their ability to help, content, help guide content creators through the process of figuring out how they create content in clean, presentation independent, well-structured chunks. To guide, move them away from imagining that their job is to style content for a particular platform and instead to help them get into the mindset of creating content with the intent that it's gonna be reused. And so what that means is that for everybody, for everybody, whether you're a content creator, whether you're a designer, whether you're a developer, whatever, whatever you know, hat you wear, it means it's gonna change the way that we work. And it means that everybody's gonna to have to work, start working with structured content and figuring out, oh, okay, I get to make decisions about how, what the interaction model is, what the design should be for a particular platform, but 
it means that I have to start by working with this base of structured content. And so that, you know, it's like in one sense it's constraining, but in the other sense it's incredibly freeing. And, you know, it's also, I, you know, I'll say it again, it's daunting. It is scary. I think, I, I genuinely believe this is going to be for sure three to five years of hard work for organizations and for some companies even a lot longer trying to figure this stuff out. And you know what? I, there's nothing that makes me happier about that because it is going to be worth it. I have never seen anybody regret putting in the effort to have flexibility in how they deploy their content. I've never seen anybody regret taking the time to figure out, hey, let me, fake, let me make some good decisions now about how my content should be structured. It's like, if you, if you want to be the TV guide of the future that has put the effort in to figuring out how your content should be structured, if you want to be the NPR of the future, be able to say, hey, I have the capability now to get my content out onto devices or platforms that I didn't even imagine. If you want to be able to do that, then you have to get yourself into a point now of saying, I'm not in the brochure publishing business or the magazine publishing business or the document publishing business. I'm not in the web page publishing business. I'm not in the mobile app publishing business. I'm in the content publishing business. My job is to figure out how to get that content out onto whatever device or platform or screen size or resolution my user wants to consume it on. You don't get to decide where your audience gets to consume your content from now on. They do. So with that, if you liked hearing me talk today but wish that I had done a lot less talking, I would strongly encourage that you buy my book <laughs> right now. Uh, and with that, I will say thank you. Thank you so much.